we're trying to break the social stigma of child sexual assault. We're trying to change the public policies. If, as you can see, we have two bills there that we're trying to pass nationwide and get more uh, uniform laws across the nation. One is no statute of limitations for all children of child sexual assault, and the other is free DNA testing and processing for all children of child sexual assault. So if you get a chance, please sign them. And what we'll do is uh, we try to pass the bills there in Louisiana, but we ask advocates if they would like to pass it in their state, you know, we will help with the signatures and we will help promote it in their state as well. So please join us. Uh, give a round of applause for all the people who have come out this morning. We have uh, Mindy Russell, Jacqueline Mindy Russell. Is that right? Thank you. And we're just going to introduce you as you come on. Mark Scones, please come up. Mark Scones is the father of Hannah Scones. Courtney Hannah Scones. Miss Lynn. Lynn Brown. And Dwight. They're a team effort. Misa Garavagelli. Uh, she can pronounce it better than I can. <laughs> And we have a special guest with us today, and she's going to try to share some of her, what she does in her story as well. And so we are the Shattering the Silence Tour and Documentary Project the Leg Sacramento. So welcome and tell them thank you for all their efforts, for all the things they do every day that no one takes notice of. It's their giving and their constant compassion and their heart of doing whatever we can for the kids because we have heard the cries of the children. We have said enough is enough. We will not be silent anymore. We were brought up in a generation where it's... A, just a family secret that you don't talk about no more that is not our generation we are here to speak we're going to speak out we're going to encourage others to speak out and we're going to surround you with support and love and that's what we do with the Foxy foundation so we want to say thank you all and i just god bless and i thank you all for coming and being a part of this i want to hand this over to mindy well, hello. It is such a privilege to be here because truly shattering the silence is something that we all long to see and hear about. I'm Chaplain Mindy Russell. I work here in Sacramento as a law enforcement chaplain with officers, their families, and with chaplains that respond to the crisis out there that you may read about or you may read or hear about on the news. So often when we respond, we respond to children that have been abused. We work with the organizations of human trafficking right here in Sacramento. We work with the churches and the schools and the hospitals when children are in the hospital because of suffering from child abuse. But more importantly than that, we know that we are in the midst of children and people that have lived through abuse. So what can we do? Well, you're going to hear about warning signs and you're going to be hearing about how to help. But I want to kind of take a different perspective today. Because you see, reactive is exactly what we do 24 hours, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. And that pains us because it's already happened. But what can we do? I have a question first. How much money does it cost the taxpayer to heal a broken child? How much does it cost to keep a healthy child healthy? I'll tell you what, from millions to pennies. And so we, as chaplains, even though we responded to over 32,000 victims last year, we wanted to do more, and so that's why we have become very proactive, getting involved in organizations such as silencing shattering of uh, I'm sorry shattering the silence so that we can get out there and educate and encourage you see when children are abused a lot of times they don't know that they have any recourse so I think one of the biggest things we can do is get into the schools and start directly going towards and helping the children we're a firm believer of the rad kids or public safety where there is training for children as young as three and a half years old being able to let them realize number one they're very special but not only are they special they're valued and if they start believing that then things that happen to them that is contrary to that they're going to start questioning sooner instead of putting the blame on them I just worked with a young girl last week that she was sent over to her uh, mom's boyfriend's house so her mom could go to work. He assaulted her. 
She didn't tell her mom, and why? Because she thought it was her fault. Her fault. She texts, thank God, her friend, and said something bad happened. I don't even know what, but it, something bad happened. And that's how we found out. Prior, but she would not have told her mom, and how many children go without telling? So we need to start teaching our children as young as three and a half, when they finally get it, they're valued, they're special. And then the next step would be that no one has the right to hurt them. No one has the right to hurt them or trick them or lie to them. And so with that going into that, if somebody has hurt you or tricked you or lied to you, that you have the right to tell and tell and tell until somebody will listen to you. If we can be that person that has that ear to listen to the child. You know, the schools are bombarded with things that they have to do. Are these children invisible? Are they being seen? It's gonna take a little bit more. And I think when the children see that they have the right to tell, that it's not their fault anymore, that it's not something that they have to be ashamed of, but they can get help. We're going to start seeing more children help. So I think the proactive is just as important in this education as is the support when it did happen. I'm a firm believer that victims focus on what they can control. Survivors focus on what they can control. But people that are victorious focus on who's in control. And as Connie mentioned, that we all have to have something bigger than ourselves, our faith, or something that holds our anchor to our life. And when we realize that we don't have to be victims, but we can be victorious, we will see, our children will see, our people will see with the support behind them that they have value, they have a voice, and they are victorious. And so I encourage every one of you that's listening to this, you may have had something that you've stuffed down so far down because you didn't want anybody to know. You're only as sick as your secrets. Let's get you well. Let somebody know so that you can be free from this once and for all. And for others that may have a thought that somebody that they know, some child, some adult might be going through this, you also need to step up and say, what can I do? Do the right thing, as difficult as sometimes it is. Do the right thing, step up, and start looking and seeing the invisible. So thank you very much, and I give this back over to Connie. Thank you, Mindy. We appreciate that very much. If you don't mind, I'm not going to climb the stairs every time. So, Mindy is so very important, and people wonder, what is the cost? People say, why should I get involved? It doesn't affect me, but it does affect you. It costs states, according to the CDC, it costs states $24.3 billion each year, and that's when somebody is sexually assaulted. Um, they may start acting out. Uh, they may start, it may start affecting the grades at school, which will affect the education system. They may become promiscuous and become teen parents, which becomes, uh, starts affecting the welfare system. And if they start getting in trouble with the law, then that affects the judicial system. And you have to consider the mental health system when they start cutting themselves, numbing themselves, um, or trying to commit suicide. So what you do is so vitally important. And I want to say, uh, just God bless you all for coming in. Thank you for all the lives that you impact and all the children. Because this is why we're here. We're here to fight for children. We're here to say, you know, please hang on, have hope, don't give up. You know, we just have courage. I know what you're going through is really tough, and you don't know if you're going to live to see 18. You know, and some and some really don't. As you can see up here, five children die a day due to neglect and child abuse. And there's shoes, and there's pictures from all across the country, uh, stories from advocates, supporters, and you can go online at foxafoundation.org and, and read about the stories. And so you can find that F is in Frank, A is in Apple, C is in Connie, S is in Sam, A is in Apple. That's F-A-C-S-A foundation.org. And we encourage you to get involved and please show up, support, print, just whatever you can do. We ask you to please come help. And now we're going to hand this to Mark Scones.
Good morning. Um, my name is Mark Stumps. I'm here to speak to you today about uh, prevention of child sexual abuse. Um, I'm 52 years old now. In 1970, I was 10. I lived in a little town in Southern California called San Jacinto. And back then, um, you know, we lived the perfect life, you know, the, the Ozzy and Harriet, the Ward Cleaver life. And that was on the outside. Um, those were the days when my parents would let us go across the street, go down the block to the store and get an ice cream or a Dr. Pepper. You guys remember Dr. Pepper it had the tin tune four on it? Remember what that means? That's when Dr. Pepper wanted you to drink their product. 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 4 p.m. <laughs> That's what it is, actually. Um, in San Jacinto, we had a park across the street and down a little ways, and myself and my brothers would go buy some candy or whatever and then go, go to the park and play and on the jungle gym, whatever. We were safe. Um, in that park was a bathroom, a public bathroom. We'd go in there, wash our hands from the candy or use the facilities, whatever. And uh, one day I walked in there by myself because it was a safe park. And there was a man in there and he asked me, actually offered me $5 if I would do some things to him. And that scared me. I ran out of there, I ran home, and I never told my parents about it because I thought I had done something wrong. I hadn't. That dirtbag did. Um, he didn't chase me. He didn't um, follow me. He didn't try and bully me. He didn't try and trick me. He was very upfront. Hey kid, here's $5 if you do this or that, the other thing. That day and age, um, my mom and dad, they'd get off work, they'd fix dinner, we'd go home, we'd have dinner, watch a little TV, do homework, take baths, go to bed, get up the next morning and, and do our thing. It was a safe world, right? Um, don't know how many are old, as old as I am, but uh, we used to have these things called clackers. And you, they were on two big plastic balls on a rope and you'd go like this and if you weren't good at it, it'd beat the snot out of your forearm. <laughs> get the uh, bruises, which I got. and. They banned them in school, they being the society, they being the leaders, and that was a 1970s attempt to protect children, which it did, um, but it took a lot of fun away from us as well. How many are old enough to remember where you were, what you were doing when President Kennedy was assassinated? Remember exactly what you were doing, where you were? Yeah, How many remembered <laughs> where you were and what you were doing when the Twin Towers came down? Um, how many remember what you were doing on the night of November 8th, 2000? Two days ago was 12 years ago, two days ago. Anybody remember that? I do. Do you remember? Did you say 2000 or 2010? 2000. 2000. 12 years ago. Um, that night, is I believe the first time I met Chaplain Mindy Russell and a bunch of her chaplains and these people were in my house and I didn't know why they were in my house all I know is that they were um, force feeding us water and snacks and they were just there to be with us about midnight that night um, some officers came into my house and they pulled me aside and they asked me to look at this picture and in that picture was a, uh, a 12 year old little, um, 12 year old girl who had been kidnapped, raped twice, and strangled on the banks of a river. That was my daughter. She's, uh, she's been dead now for as long as she was alive. And it's uh, hard to deal with. This, uh, I'll finally call, finally, uh, fondly call this guy a dirtbag, um, came down the hill into our neighborhood. And our neighborhood was about 20 financial scales down from El Dorado Hills where he lived. He came down our neighborhood and um, he went looking for a young girl. And the reason he did that is he was in, involved in uh, the internet sale and trade of child pornography. His father had told him that if he got arrested and tried and convicted of child pornography, he could go to jail or prison. 
and this 19 year old dirtbag told his dad that uh, if he was going to prison, he wanted to go to prison for something worth going to prison for. So he decided to come into our neighborhood, follow my daughter, and kidnap her with the threat of a gun. He took her up to the Feather River, about 40 miles from here, raped her twice and strangled her. He said in an interview later that he did that because he had never experienced a, a pristine girl, I'll put it that way. And he wanted to do that before he went to prison. Currently, he's in Southern California in prison for life without the possible possibility of parole. He's 31 years old. I look and make sure he's still there about uh, once or twice a week. And he's going to be there till he dies. Unless somebody in this building decides on their outgoing time that I'm going to commute his sentence, which scares the hell out of me. Sorry for my friends. Um, Anyway, Courtney was a victim of child sexual abuse. Courtney is one of many, many children that have succumbed to the pressures of these predators out there that are feeding on our children. Some children are abused, their physical wounds heal, their emotional wounds may or may not heal in the future, some never heal. I know people Unfortunately, now that we're in this club of parents that have um, children that were murdered, we know people that, whose children have been missing for 20 plus years. They don't know where their daughter is. They don't know where their son is. And we at least know where Courtney is. She's about 15 miles from here um, under a headstone. But we know where our daughter is. These other folks don't. There's too many people out there that are missing their children and after the media frenzy softens, after several years, the names kind of go away, they fade into the background, they become a cold case. Sometimes we have a wonderful law enforcement officer or somebody who decides to take that on as a, as a project and reopens it, and sometimes they find the, the person who did this child wrong, sometimes not. We as a society need to come together to stop this. It's terrible. Um, the children do not deserve it. It's not their fault. I don't care whether it's a guy down the street. I don't care whether it's a female Sunday school teacher down in a little town south of here. I don't care if it's a pastor or a priest. I don't care if it's a father or mother. Whoever's doing this child wrong needs to be arrested, convicted, and their butts need to be in jail. When, I, when, when Courtney was taken, I was asked to provide a DNA sample because I was the first subject, or the first suspect, rather. And um, I did that freely. I knew I had nothing to hide, so I gave that freely. Uh, DNA upon, federal, um, upon a felony arrest is going around the nation now, and I truly believe in that. It can solve crimes that have been unsolved. Um, like me, if a person has nothing to hide, privacy concerns aside, they should not have a problem with giving a cheek swab. I don't have a problem with it. I had nothing to do with it other than I was not there to protect my daughter. I lost track on this about half an hour ago. Um, so we're going to hear today from some people about some legislative efforts that um, have happened some of which uh, were passed and um, are having a negative impact on California and our um, population, our citizens. And I don't want the guy who raped and killed my daughter to end up walking back out on these streets because somebody back in this building said they think that it's wrong that he got life without parole. So thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. and. Um, I'll turn this over to Lynn and Dwight. Dwight, you going to talk today? No. <laughs> he always says he's not going to talk, and then he takes over the microphone. So we'll see. Uh, good morning. I'm Lynn Brown. This is my husband, Dwight Brown. He's also my partner in Advocates for Public Safety. We started Advocates for Public Safety a year ago in direct response to legislation here in California that is dramatically eroding public safety, law enforcement safety, 
And the public's being, in my opinion, intentionally misled about who is being impacted, who's being released to our communities, and the identifying terminology used of low-risk offender, non-serious, non-violent offender, and non-sex offender. We hear this being marketed as, don't worry, they're just low-risk offenders that are coming back out into your community. They're just non-serious, non-violent folks, which leads the general public to believe they're petty thieves, stole a bicycle out of a driveway, when in fact there are violent sexual predators, violent criminals, gang members being released from jail, not in Sacramento, but in many counties across the state, early, or not spending any time in jail at all for violating the terms of their parole. Parole is a form of incarceration. They're still serving their sentence that that victim deserves. Justice, that sentence, is the only piece that can sometimes give a victim or a victim survivors any sense of justice. So when we start taking away that piece of justice from the victim, this building here completely violated Marcy's Law, which in California is the Victim's Bill of Rights. So this morning, Connie talked about legislation that she'd like to see passed, and that's what we have to do is become involved not only in getting legislation that is effective to our protection of our most vulnerable citizens, children and the elderly, but we have to watch what our legislators are doing. This was passed, Assembly Bill 109, California Assembly Bill 109, is the legislation that Dwight and I are talking about today. It's called prison realignment. It's the largest realignment of the California prison system, I believe in the history of California, if not in the history of California, at least in the last several decades. So bear in mind what I say about the non-serious, non-violent, non-sex offenders. Uh, they're referred to as low risk when they're released into the community. Uh, they do not go to state prison for the crimes that I'm going to tell you about. They go to county jail now. And so they, they are punished at the county jail level. But when I read some of these to you, I think that you're going to feel the same way I do. These should be punishable by state prison with supervision afterwards by parole. Probation is a great model for the true low-risk offender, but most people in our state prisons in California have failed probation at least once and several, several of them repeatedly. Now they're going back to the same supervision model that they've already failed. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, some of the penal codes in California that are now considered non-serious, non-violent, or non-sex related, so anyone who commits these and does jail time on these offenses will be considered a low-risk offender in California. Uh, let's see, Penal Code Section 181. Every person who holds or attempts to hold any person in involuntary servitude or assumes or attempts to assume rights of ownership over any person or who sells or attempts to sell any person to another or receives money or anything of value in consideration of placing any person in the custody or under the power of control of another or who buys or attempts to buy any person or pays money or delivers anything of value in consideration of having another person placed in his or her custody or under his or her control, or who knowingly aids or assists in any manner, anyone thus offending is punishable by county jail and possibly no supervision upon release. Does that sound non-serious to anybody here? That's heinous to me. That's ridiculous to me. It's called slavery. It's called indentured servant, servitude. And in California, apparently, that's just not serious anymore. Uh, another one is Penal Code, penal code 186.28. Knowingly provide a firearm to commit a 186.22 felony. Now, what does that mean? What's that? Kidnapping. So if I provide a firearm to someone, who's going to kidnap someone, pimping and pandering, human trafficking. Can you believe human trafficking? I'm going to give someone a gun. They go and commit 
human trafficking crimes. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not serious. What I did wasn't serious. Any crime in which the perpetrator induces, encourages, or persuades a person under 18 years of age to, get, to engage in a commercial sex act. Any crime in which the perpetrator, through force, fear, coercion, deceit, violence, and I thought these guys were nonviolent now, violence, duress, menace, or threat of unlawful injury to the victim or to another person, causes a person under 18 years of age to, get, to engage in a commercial sex act.